The last time around, we just developed this wave equation, which gives us, uh, which relates the second spatial derivative of particle displacements to the second temporal derivative of particle displacements, which we represented by uh, the symbol chi. And um, so we have d2 chi dx squared is equal to 1 over v squared d2 chi dt squared. This is our wave equation. And it's a one-dimensional wave equation. So we aren't we aren't taking into consideration spherical divergence or um, the shape of the wavefront. We're, assume, we're assuming that it's planar, so we're ignoring things like spherical divergence and absorption along the uh, path of wave propagation. Uh, this gives us a general solution of the form f of x minus vt. This would just be the location of the wavefront or some part of the wavefront uh, along its propagation path, and then v would be the interval velocity and the, or the wave propagation velocity, and t would be the travel time. And we could also have as a solution, we could have e to the, we could have the real part of e to the i kx minus omega t. We mentioned this the last time, and I just want to point out that this can lead to some confusion here. We're using k to mean a couple different things. Uh, we have k here equal to 2 pi over lambda or omega over v, and that shouldn't be confused with the k that we used um, when we developed this uh, wave equation here where k is uh, equal to v squared. So, so we saw the last time around that the wave velocity or the square of the wave velocity v squared was equal to the change in pressure produced by a change in density dp d rho. And this was equal to k, again not to be confused with this k. And so v then would be equal to the square root of that change in pressure with change in density. And we also pointed out that if we know what the shape of the wave field is at any particular point in space or time, then we know what its shape is at any point in space and any point in time. So these solutions here tell us that if, we, if we're at a particular time t2 and we want to know what the shape of the uh, wave field, uh, the wavefront looks like, and we knew what it was at some particular point x1. In order to determine what its shape is at x2, we just look back a distance vt2 to that point at some earlier uh, point in time. So this shape just simply propagates through space, and if we have a minus sign, it's propagating to the right. If we have a plus sign, then the wave field is propagating to the left. So this is our wave equation, and um, what we're going to do this time around is we're going to develop it uh, again. We're going to develop this wave equation, but we're going to take a look at it from the standpoint of little segments of differential mass associated with a vibrating string. So kind of imagine this as part of a, a vibrating string. It could be a guitar string or a piano string or whatever your favorite uh, stringed instrument uh, is. And uh, we're looking at the vibrations in the z direction. So we have some differential movement of these differential masses as we move differential intervals uh, through along the length of the string delta x. And if we look at the deflection of the string from the horizontal, that deflection would make an angle theta i minus 1 in this particular case with the horizontal, and theta i with respect to the horizontal in this case. So notice that this differential mass, different element of differential mass is being pulled on uh, in the upward direction by tension to the right, and in the downward direction by tension to the left. So we, divided, we divide this string up into a series of segments. So we've got the segments uh, shown over here. They all have equal mass. And the tension is constant throughout the length of the string, but it, we have a variable deflection of the string from the horizontal. So these are small angles. And then we're concerned with uh, the vertical displacements that we have here in the z direction. And they're going to be varying along the length of the string as, string as well in proportion to the upward force acting on each differential string element. And that uh, upward force, you can see over here that this differential mass is going to be pulled in the upward direction 
by a force equal to t times the sine of theta sub i. It would be this component over here, and that it would be pulled in the downward direction by t sine theta i minus 1, so that the net force on this uh, ith element here, uh, f sub i, would be equal to t times the difference in those two sines, sine theta i in the upward direction, minus sine theta i minus 1, pulling it in the downward direction. So in this case, we can see theta i is greater than theta i minus 1, so we expect this differential mass to be moving upward, to be accelerating in the upward direction. And also note that since uh, theta, these thetas are small, if you've uh, plucked the string on a uh, guitar or some other instrument, you know that the deflections are pretty small. And uh, so we can make this approximation here that the sine of theta sub i is approximately equal to z sub i plus 1 minus z sub i over delta x. So we just have the difference in the z component of this triangle, if you will. I haven't labeled it over delta x. So the uh, side opposite over the side adjacent. And for a small angle approximation, this is just going to be z i plus 1 minus z i. And for sine theta i minus 1, this will be z sub i minus z sub i minus 1 over delta x. So these two signs then, we're, we're using these uh, substitutions or these approximations. And then we're coming back to this relationship over here, which kind of gives us, in this case, it's going to be a net upward force since theta sub i is greater than uh, theta sub i minus 1. So we'll have some net upward force or force per unit area acting on the string. And this would be equal to the tension times z sub i plus 1 minus z over delta x minus z sub i minus z sub i minus 1 over delta. So if we combine the terms over here, we have uh, t, as we mentioned, uh, z sub i plus 1 minus z sub i over delta x minus z sub i minus z sub i minus 1 over delta x. That gives us z sub i plus 1 minus 2 z sub i plus z sub i minus 1 over delta x. And this is really just a, a change, kind of a two times a delta z here. So we have a delta delta z. So we have this delta z and then we have this delta z and we have the difference in the two which gives us the equivalent of a delta delta z. So in the limit of it, these infinitesimally small changes we can write the above equation as f sub i equal to t times the d2z delta x but then if we multiply by 1, where 1 is delta x over delta x, we get a delta x here as a factor, and then we square the delta x in the denominator here. So we get t delta x times d2z, d2z dx squared as our uh, net upward force. And, and again, these are just the, the delta z's, delta z delta x. So, the force at any one point along the string, uh, this, this is related to feature 3 that we talked about the last time. We're just coming back to this relationship here and looking at the force. The force for the mass on the mass of a segment uh, delta x in length with unit cross section would be uh, rho delta v. That would be the, the mass. That would give us a force equal to rho delta x times d2z dt squared. So, if we draw an equivalence between rho delta x d2z dt squared and what we have over here, uh, t delta x d2z dx squared, so we have an equivalence here between those two, this uh, upward force. Now uh, we cancel out the delta x's. We have uh, t d2z dx squared is equal to rho d2z dt squared. That gives us d2z dx squared is equal to rho over t d2z dt squared. So this looks an awful lot like the equation that we had before uh, where we were dealing with particle displacements from an equilibrium position. We have a different constant though. We have um, instead of 1 over v squared, this wave propagation velocity squared, we have rho over, we have the density over the tension in the string. So that tells us that this 
1 over v squared, or that v in this particular case would be equal to the square root of t over rho, or the square root of the reciprocal of this, t over rho. So we've developed the wave equation from a couple different uh, starting points, and we see the v squared is related to changes in pressure with changes in density, this delta p delta rho, uh, or dp d rho. And uh, we've also seen that it can be related to string tension and density, or mass per unit length. So uh, uh, rho as t over rho. So we're seeing, again, that um, uh, physical properties associated with the medium through, medium through which the wave is propagating uh, appear in this wave equation as constants in this uh, in this wave equation here. So we have two different uh, two different expressions arriving, telling us something something different about the uh, about the medium through which the wave is propagating. So. Next time we're going to even we're going to come at the development of the wave equation from yet another direction. We'll be taking a look at uh, stress strain relationships and uh, and we'll pull out some additional as aspects of the elastic property relationships uh, similar to what we've seen up here uh, as we go through uh, uh, another uh, development uh, exercise. So I hope this has been informative and uh, thanks for joining us and uh, see you next time.